However, even if hopes were unrealistic and were swiftly dashed, this doesn't mean that, they, that British people had known that they were going to be unrealistic when they went out to these places in the first instance. In fact, the fact that they were so disappointed instead reflects that they'd been hoping for a lot more than they ended up getting. For example, perhaps the most famous capitalist imperialist of all, Cecil Rhodes, was disappointed by what he found when he pushed into South Road, Southern Rhodesia, or what is now Zimbabwe. He thought he was going to find a lot of gold, but little was immediately forthcoming. It's my belief that economics was more important than strategic considerations in accounting for British involvement in Africa between 1868 and 1902. For example, Britain occupied Egypt in 1882 not only because of the ready access to the Suez Canal, but also because Egypt was felt to be one of the key places in which cotton would grow in the future. Gain access to this market and you have a way of attempting to prevent the influence of Americans, as I've just discussed. The British Empire, let us not forget more than anything else, started life as a trading and commercial concern. This wasn't merely the case with Africa. It was there in India. You've got the East India Company in India. It was there in Canada with the Hudson Bay Trading Company and so on. In Africa, many parts of the continent were initially controlled by companies rather than by the government itself. So, for instance, you've got the Royal Niger Company, led by Sir George Goldie, and then you've got the British East Africa Company, which is led by men such as Lord Lugard, who went on to later become important in a government sphere, but initially cut his teeth in a commercial sector. These kinds of people played an important part in the expansion of British control over Nigeria and Uganda, respectively. Royal Niger Company, surprise, surprise, in Nigeria, and the Imperial British East Africa Company in Uganda. It was only when these companies were disbanded, usually because they ran into financial trouble, that the government stepped in. This later move by the government may have been partly because of strategic considerations, but the routes to involvement were primarily economic. However, we can't separate the two entirely. After all, Cecil Rhodes had a vision of making lots of money, but also seeing to it that Britain annexed a lot of territory. His grand scheme was for Britain to hold on to land between Cairo and the Cape Colony in South Africa. So we can see you can't detach the two motives entirely from one another. However, I'd still argue that Rhodes was a shrewd investor. He made a fortune from mining in South Africa, and he so, so I think he wouldn't have bothered expen, expanding into places had he felt that they'd lose him money in the long term. But in making this case that economics is more important, one needs to be precise as to exactly what one is saying. Some historians have argued that Britain's involvement in Africa was primarily shaped by the direct control that capitalists had over politicians. For instance, Shula Marx has argued that Britain's involvement in South Africa and in the Boer War of 1899 to 1902 in particular was shaped by the needs of the capitalists and more specifically those who ran the gold mining industry. This shifts the balance of importance away from Joseph Chamberlain, the colonial secretary, and Alfred Milner, London's head man on the spot. According to this line of thinking, Milner and Chamberlain went to war because Afrikaners threatened the stable extraction of gold from South Africa and a steady flow of cattle from South Africa to Britain, that they were merely responding to the interests of mining men such as Rhodes. However, I think this is going too far. Chamberlain and Milner were too headstrong and determined to be pushed around and dictated to by, by mining interests. Instead, they had their own aims for British imperial power. Many of these centred around how to develop uh, economic links further between the different parts of the empire, but these weren't merely mining interests. This is not to say that mining was absent from their minds, because it wasn't, but to see the hidden hand of capitalist mine owners as the central motive in all of this is pushing things too far. So when we say that economic considerations were more important than strategic ones, it helps if we're precise about exactly what we mean by economic considerations. As we move towards a conclusion today, 
It's worth noting that all of this comes with a big proviso attached. Historians seek to impose order on the chaos of the past. But none of these arguments and theories that I've mentioned today should detract from the chaotic nature of the scramble itself, as is clearly suggested by the use of the term scramble to begin with. No, nobody scrambles in a kind of rational, clear-cut way. You know, this, the scramble was confused. Uh, it often happened without any sense of coordinated planning. Each European power was a tangled web of different influences, of people pushing, or at least trying to push, things in different directions. For instance, as I briefly noted earlier, some people thought there were lots of minerals, lots of diamonds and gold to be gotten from the inland regions of Africa, whilst other people were a bit more sceptical. Some thought that all, all of what was going on was a good investment for the future in terms of both economics and national prestige, while others were profoundly sceptical about it, some even actively opposing it, expressing outrage at the financial waste it was, it was felt to involve, the uselessness of the exercise. They were convinced that it went against Britain's best interests, and indeed the entire British political and economic ethos. The tale from Lon the London end of things is therefore not a simple tale of a Conservative or a Liberal Party acting as one. Even within the different parties, there were splits within cabinets, as was demonstrated in the Liberal cabinet in the lead up to the occupation of Egypt in 1882. Furthermore, there are other reasons why the British expanded into other territories. For instance, the case has been made by some historians that an increased British involvement in Africa was partly because of a desire for greater scientific knowledge, or because of a desire on the part of missionaries to convert Africans to Christianity. Or it could be argued that there was domestic pressure for a greater involvement in Africa. For instance, the newspaper campaigns of the 1884 to 85 period can be said to be part of the reason why Gladstone reluctantly agreed to send troops out to Khartoum in their an unsuccessful attempt to relieve General Gordon whilst he was being besieged by the forces of the Mahdi. However, for the reasons that I've discussed today, I think it's clear that economic and strategic considerations were the two single most important factors. And despite the difficulties of drawing firm conclusions that I've already noted, some points can be made. One argument we can make is that the British felt taking territory in Africa was seen as a way of maintaining its preeminence in the face of others. This was part and parcel of an attempt by the British to both maintain its political clout at the diplomatic meetings of Europe and to make itself better prepared if it needed to react against any other power in the future, such as if the Russians ever saw fit to stir up instability against the British state in the northwest of India. Nevertheless, it would seem that, at least in my opinion, economics provides the most compelling reason for the scramble. By this time, it was clear that the process of European economic penetration could not go on, not go on smoothly. The global market and the encouragement of Africa to enter into that market was no longer sufficient to deliver what Europe needed. Obstacles had arisen which only formal imperialism, the extension of formal military and political control, could remove. It was now believed that Africans could not do it themselves. They were incapable of modernising themselves. And you could argue that in the middle of the 19th century there's a, a massive change in British racial attitudes towards Africa. After big events such as the Governor Iyer controversy in Jamaica in 1865, the Indian Mutiny in 1857, it's possible to argue that people in power in, in London suddenly began, began to increasingly doubt the ability of Africans to govern things for themselves. Therefore, the British and every other interested European power, it was felt, would have to do this for them. Ultimately, in economic terms, the key issue seems to have been capital investment. If the British were to become seriously involved in Africa economically, if they were to invest capital, political control was required. Political control was needed to create the conditions for trade and economic growth. And this can be seen most clearly from one of the most important mechanisms for the extension of British interests in the empire, the company. 
Whilst members of the various companies were undoubtedly ideologically imperialist, more often than not, at the end of the day, these people were involved in other parts of the world because they thought they could make a profit. The extension of British influence into Africa was for a variety of reasons. It was partly a religious move. It was partly a thirst for knowledge and to roll back the boundaries of the unknown. To map out and to seek to understand other parts of the world. Partly people went out to Africa because they liked shooting wild animals and having adventures. But above all of these motives stands the desire to make money, to go out into the world and to seek one's fortune.